Before we read our scripture today, let us have a prayer that we may understand scripture. God of word and wisdom, your spirit inspired the authors of scripture with faithfulness in their day. Send us your Holy Spirit as we listen to the scriptures in our time. Give us fresh understanding and a vision of how to live out your wisdom in the example of Christ, your living word. Amen. Friends, our lesson today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 36. Again, this is the story of Jesus walking on the water. Hear now God's word to us. Immediately, he made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Genesaret. After the people of that place recognized him, they sent word to that whole surrounding region, and people brought all who were sick to him, and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. This is the word of God. Please pray with me. Jesus, we are grateful for this story of you walking on water. And for this story where Peter steps out in faith. May our hearts be open to you, Holy Spirit, as we step out in faith and seek to be open to all that you call us to do, all the ways you call us to love in your name. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I remember my first sermon. I was 16 years old, and it was Youth Sunday at La Jolla Presbyterian Church. My dad was an associate pastor, and maybe when people saw me come up to the pulpit to preach, maybe some of them thought that I would become a pastor one day. I didn't think I was going to become a pastor one day. I thought I was going to become a history professor. And it was a little scary to step out in faith and preach that first sermon. But people were kind. It was a good experience. And little did I know that first step out in faith, what it would do, what it would lead to in my life. Do you ever remember God calling you to step out in faith? What was that situation for you? I know it happened many times for all of us. Think of a time when you had to step out in faith, and what happened? How did God show up? Well, today's story, we're going to explore looking at it almost like we would a play. We're going to look at it as four acts in a play. We're going to enjoy the story and see how it unfolds because the writer of this story is really trying to shape it in a way that touches our hearts. So act one, Jesus is on the mountain. And the disciples have been sent out in the boat across the sea. Jesus is praying. Remember last week we talked about how the rhythm of Jesus' spirituality involved 
prayer and community and ministry. Well, he's up on the mountain and he's praying. He's been exhausted a little bit, I think, by the crowds. So he goes out alone for some solitude. And he's having a really special time of prayer with his heavenly father. But the disciples, they're having some struggles. So act one, we see them out trying their best to get across the sea, but the storm is against them. And Jesus is on that mountain. Now, do you ever feel like that sometimes? Like you're on a boat, you're trying to traverse the sea, the wind is against you, and you're not sure where God is. Well, Jesus in this story is actually has a pretty good view of where those disciples are. He can see it all, and he is present there. But the disciples, the disciples are not aware. They're not aware that Jesus is seeing them, and they're struggling. So that's Acts 1, Act 1. Act 2, Jesus decides, well, I'm going to head towards the disciples. Jesus begins walking on the water, and he approaches the boat. The disciples see Jesus, and they think he is a ghost. So in Act 2, Jesus shows up. He's getting closer to them, but they're still not sure who this character is. Is this a ghost? Sometimes in our own journey with God, it's hard for us to see God's face. It's hard for us to see Jesus when we're feeling scared and alone, and we need him to come closer. Act 3, Jesus comes close enough that the disciples realize who he is. And Peter is ready to, to do something about that. He's excited. Jesus is walking on water. This is great. And I want to step out and join him on the sea. And so Peter says, hey, Jesus, can I come out onto the sea? Can I walk to you? And Jesus says, go ahead, come. Peter starts walking on the water. He steps out of that boat. He starts walking on the water. He's doing pretty well, but he takes a look at that storm and he starts to sink. He starts to sink. And what happens, thankfully, is Jesus reaches out his hand, lifts Peter up. He very sweetly says, oh, you have little faith. It's okay. And he lifts him up out of the water and brings him into the boat. And what I want to think about here is this beautiful connection between grace and faith. Grace and faith. Jesus is the personification of grace in this story. He shows up, he initiates, he comes to them. In response to that grace, that love expressed in Jesus, Peter has the courage to step out of the boat in faith, and he actually starts walking on the water. But when he starts to sink, grace comes back again and lifts Peter up. Grace, faith, then grace again. Sometimes you may wonder, why is this church called a church of grace, hope, and love? I'll tell you honestly why. Because grace is this very beautiful word that I think attracts people and faith can be an intimidating word. Sometimes we need to first hear the word of grace before we can understand the gift of faith. Sometimes faith, that word, sounds like something we have to manufacture. I have to have faith for today. I have to have this belief, this courage to go out in my own strength. That's not really what faith is, but we get this idea that that's what faith is about. But no, Faith is actually born out of grace. For by grace you are saved through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's a work of grace. That is, faith is a gift that comes to us. And so when we were talking about this church, when the early years of my uh, ministry here, actually during that first year, I talked to the session about you know, our name and, and what we could be called or focus on in terms of our new mission statement. And people talked about the gift of grace in this church. And I realized that that's always been a very powerful word, and it's a powerful word for Presbyterians, grace. It's part of our theology. 
But I want to remind you that Paul also talks about faith, hope, and love in 1 Corinthians 13. And today's lesson is actually about stepping out in faith. And I know that can be scary, but it's less scary when we know that grace is actually the foundation of our faith. That's so important. That's so important. Now, I want to give you this idea about grace that may be a little different for you. We normally talk about grace, I think, as it relates sometimes to our sin. So someone sins, there's grace for forgiveness. But grace is more than that. Grace is actually about power and support and love. Not only when we struggle with sin, but when we just struggle with life. And in that sense, Jesus needed grace when he was on earth. Jesus was not a lone ranger, remember? Jesus would spend time with his heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit. He would also gain support from his disciples, from his mom, from his dad when he was younger. He had friends. Jesus needed community. And the story of the transfiguration is a beautiful one, and we're going to weave that into this story because it is Transfiguration Sunday. And actually, it's interesting. This story of the transfiguration comes just three chapters later in Matthew 17. Let me read it to you. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Do you see in this story that Jesus goes up to the mountain again to pray? He brings along some disciples with him. And here Jesus receives this message. You are my Beloved son, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Don't you think Jesus needed to hear that at that time in his ministry? He needed to hear from the Father that he was beloved. He also heard it, by the way, at the beginning of his ministry. That's what we're going to talk about on Wednesday, that Jesus heard, you are my beloved son, when he was baptized. And then as he's getting ready to sacrifice his life for us, for the world, he hears it again. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And he's not alone up there. He, he's got the Holy Spirit. He's got God, the glory of God. He also has Elijah and Moses show up, prophets of old who are ready to give him encouragement for his movement as a prophet of the day that he was called to live out and which we benefit from now. So Jesus received his own form of grace that gave him faith to face the cross. Isn't that exciting? I think that's part of the gift of faith for Jesus. And that's why he wanted the disciples to know that if they could trust in his love, they could walk out in faith too. Act 4. Jesus enters the boat with Peter and what happens? The winds cease. The winds cease. Jesus brings peace to the water, and the boat is able to cross to the other side, where Jesus continues to spread the gospel and does miracles of healing. In my own life right now, as your pastor, I am realizing that I need to remember Jesus is in the boat of this church. Jesus is in our boat, and Jesus is the one who will bring peace to our lives with all the different struggles we're facing. We need that in our, our awareness of the world as well. 
But in my own life right now, I am realizing that I need to know that Jesus is in the boat with me and with you all. Jesus is really the captain of this boat. We probably all take time uh, at the wheel with Jesus, and I think he holds his arms with us maybe, holds the wheel with us. But it's not something that we have to do alone. It's only through the power of Jesus and Jesus' love that we can ride that boat across the side wherever God is leading us. God is reminding me right now to make Jesus my first love, to return to my first love. Valentine's was a really good season for me to remember about returning to God as my first love. And I know if I do that, I will be able to live out this calling as a pastor. I still remember that first sermon It was this passage of Jesus walking on the water. It was my invitation to step out in faith. And now as I reflect on this story with you again, I want to remind us we're all called to step out in faith. Last Sunday, I told you about a revival happening at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. A little update on that revival. If you haven't seen information about it on YouTube or in the news, it's growing, folks. 22 different colleges and probably more now have people from those colleges have shown up and have gone back to their colleges and some other schools now have revival breaking out. What is revival? What does that mean? What's happening is a lot of young adults and then a lot of other ages are coming to campuses, college campuses, and they are worshiping Jesus and there's a sweet spirit of peace and love coming down on them, like a cloud of love. And it's bringing such freedom to these young adults and then to whoever shows up. It's like the presence of the Holy Spirit is more tangible in these places and and something's happening. People are asking for forgiveness of sin. They're feeling passionate about their relationship with Jesus. And what happens when a revival happens, as my wife reminds me at the historian, is that when people get on fire for Jesus, they start to do mission. They start to care more uh, in a more focused way for people who are houseless or who are hungry or who are in prison. So revival doesn't just begin only with an experience of love. It begins with that love, but it leads to love expressed in action. And actually, the campus pastor at Asbury University was doing a sermon series on putting love into action when he preached a message about letting the spirit of love flow through you and allowing the Holy Spirit to come in you and through you in love, he was preaching that message and he prayed, revive us with your love at the chapel service. What happened? The Holy Spirit showed up, students decided to stay and keep worshiping, and the revival began at Asbury University. Friends, the revival is going to come to Newburgh too. I feel it. I feel it because I know some other folks in town who are catching the fire. And I know George Fox students. I know their heart for Jesus. And it's going to come to our church. And it's already come into my heart. It's come into Karen's heart. I tell you, if you start watching some of these worship services online, it'll come into your heart. This passion for Jesus, it's just, it's welling up inside. And Jesus is becoming our first love again. I want to encourage you to pray for revival. Again, it will be a holistic revival. It will be one that leads to compassion for all people, especially the vulnerable. And I know our church is called to live into this as well. It's one way we step out in faith, to believe for a new move of God in our time, a new move of the Holy Spirit. And I especially mention again, this is for all of us, but we especially want this for young people. We want young people to get the feeling of that Jesus love that will change your life forever. And young people are crying out for that. So many young people right now are struggling with anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation. The presence of Jesus coming down in a tangible way is what we all need. It's what they need. It will set their life on a course that will lead to great transformation of them and others. And it's what happened to me when I was a young adult. I went to an Urbana missions conference In Champaign, Illinois, put on by InterVarsity, I felt the fire of God on my life, and then I started an urban ministry at Whitworth College to people who were in poverty. 
It set me on a course for ministry. And I know it can happen for young adults. I know it can happen for all of us if we open our hearts to the move of God and if we step out in faith. God has been bringing me to 1 John 4. And I'm going to read that to you because this, I think, is the heart of the message of the revival. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And later in 1 John 4, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Remember Jesus walking on the water towards the boat. They're scared at first. He says, do not be afraid. And that's his message to all of us as we step out of the boat together. I'm not sure exactly how all of us are called to step out in faith. I know how, as a congregation, I think we're called. But you may have individual things you know you're called to step out in faith for. Talk to Jesus about those things and hear that message from him. Do not be afraid. And then step out and hold his hand. A young adult that I uh, met with this last week shared with me a song. And it's a song called uh, from the band We the Kingdom. So look this up also on YouTube. <laughs> we the Kingdom, that's the band. The song is, we will be, um, is Dancing on the Waves. Dancing on the Waves. So look that up. We the Kingdom is the band. Dancing on the Waves is the song. And it's this beautiful image. It's a beautiful image. And I'm, I'm kind of in the mood. I'm not going to start dancing. But I'm in the mood to dance because Kiara and I just went to the father-daughter dance last night. And so I am in the mood to dance. But Dancing on the Waves is the song. And the idea is this, as, as you get used to stepping out of the boat in faith, that you will begin to hold that hand of Jesus and you'll actually start dancing on the waves, friends. You'll start dancing on the waves. The life of faith will become more natural than the life of fear. The life of love will become more powerful than the life of anger or hate. It will become a life full of the joy of Jesus and people will feel it and they'll want that for themselves and the Holy Spirit will show up and minister. You know, David and Esther Chris are a gift to our church, friends. Amen. They're a gift to our church because they have the power of the Holy Spirit moving in them. I know it's a little new for some of us with this charismatic experience sometimes. There's a gentleness to the presence of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have to be wild and crazy. But if this is new for you, know that we have been blessed with some people who know the power of the Holy Spirit and it's coming into the Presbyterian Church because we need it. We need it desperately. We need an experience of the Holy Spirit that will fire us up in love and passion. We'll be calm. We'll be quiet sometimes. We'll be thoughtful. But we also need this emotion of love to experience so that we are compelled to go out and care for the most vulnerable. Thank God for David and Esther and others of you here who are willing to be faithful to share that message of Jesus and to use your gifts for the kingdom of God. May God bless us as we step out in faith and let us pray together. Holy Spirit, we feel your presence in this room. We recognize that there's a revival going around the country right now and in other places in our world. People from different countries are coming to Wilmore, Kentucky. Jesus, we know that town has doubled in size just this last week. And we want to catch the fire. We want to catch the fire of you, Holy Spirit, so that we can live out our faith faithfully in tangible ways of love. Show us where we need to step out in faith and give us the courage to do it, knowing that grace is there in your hand reaching out to us. We love you. We praise you. Help us to walk closely to you on this journey of faith. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.